Hi, I'm Dave Seaver of Mind Alive. Today, I'm excited to share with you a case study of a brain injury involving a young man who I call ET, showing the role of the spine and how it influences brain function. In particular, we're gonna be looking at a subluxated atlas bone. As the atlas bone contains the brain stem, and when an atlas bone gets twisted out of position, it can cause some very dramatic and troubling effects on the brain. So yes, yeah, so we are gonna take a look at this young man, 20 years old, and what happened to him when he twisted his atlas bone and why this should be addressed in all cases of not just concussion, but whiplash, or with anyone who has maybe jostled their head in some fashion and, and now is struggling neurologically with it. So first question is, what is an atlas bone? Well, Wikipedia says that an atlas bone is the topmost vertebrae and with the axis, which is the bone underneath, it forms the joint connecting the skull and spine. The atlas and axis are specialized to allow a greater range of motion than normal vertebrae. They are also responsible for the nodding and rotational movements of the head, looking left and right, up, down, and so on. Here we go. Here's a picture of the atlas bone and the axis as we see right here at the base of the skull. And on the right-hand picture, we can see how that seats on the skull and how it affects rotational movements and so on. So now what is the subluxated atlas bone? Well, subluxation, it refers to when a vertebrae becomes misaligned or moves out of its normal position. This is referred to in the chiropractic profession as a subluxation. The atlas is the only freely moving, movable bone in the spine, which means it can misalign with very little force. And here's an example of a subluxated atlas bone. We can see on the left side, this is a normal looking spine and a person standing up straight, or in this case, a skeleton standing up straight. And we can see how the hips are aligned, the shoulders are aligned, and the neck and spine are also in, in straight vertical alignment as well. When the atlas and or the cervical bones to some degree get subluxated, we can see how they become twisted, there's a tilt, they're crooked. And in the process, it throws off the entire spine it causes a hip to pull up and it causes one leg to become functionally longer than the other leg, which causes all sorts of pain, typically in the longer leg. And there's also pain in the shorter leg in the hip area and stuff too, from the muscles being in spasm. The detrimental effects of a subluxated atlas are so much a part of a concussion that no neurotherapy should be done until the atlas bone has been realigned. 95% of my clients report moderate to exceptional benefits from realigning their atlas bone. So what that means is when I have a concussed client, I won't even bother doing a brain map on them or an EEG or any type of therapy because there's no point in it until the atlas bone has been addressed first, as it will resolve sometimes half to most of the symptoms that the person is experiencing. Now here's an example of how it affects the musculature, typically on one side of the body. And in this case here, we can see the entire right side of this person's body is all in spasm. IT bands will go into spasm too, and then sometimes cause severe knee problems. And then medicine will want to take a look, of course, at the knee problems and uh, do surgery or something to that effect when really the issue has nothing to do with the knee at all, but it has to do with a spasmed IT band, which is pulling on the structures of the knee, causing, in a sense, uh, mislocated pain that uh, the, typically the medical profession misses. Now we can see here that definitely see C1, that's the atlas bone there. And we can see that there's all sorts of uh, cerebral arteries and nerves and things all tightly bound in that area. So when that bone gets out of place, it affects vasculature and other nerves, not just the brainstem as well, but other, other structures for sure. These are some of the symptoms associated with a subluxated atlas bone. They, they can throw the hormones off. It can cause brain fog. It can cause uh, poor coordination with movement. 
Uh, eye movement issues, it can cause uh, issues with heart, lungs, GI tract, blood volume, internal organs. It always, pretty much always causes a difference in leg length. It can affect the immune system. It can certainly trigger pain. And I can say often this pain is not in the area where the problem actually occurs, like in this case where the, the tissues around a subluxated atlas bone, but because the pressure of the atlas bone is affecting the brainstem and inflaming the brainstem, nerves that exit through the spinal cord can give you all kinds of pain and problems in parts of the body that are seemingly unrelated to the atlas bone entirely. And so it could be quite easy to throw a clinician off if this is not understood. Anyway, energy loss, dizziness, nausea, lightheadedness, and so on. Also, not included in this picture are the effects that it can have on neurotransmitters, which I believe is happening as well, based on symptoms that some of my clients have exhibited uh, with a subluxated atlas bone. And that is right here. So in the, in the actual brainstem, uh, some key neurotransmitters are generated, such as norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, and acetylcholine. And I do believe there are times when these get thrown into uh, an unbalanced condition. For instance, when I have someone with a concussion and their eyes closed, alpha frequency is running fast. I suspect that it is a, a, some kind of a ratio that gets thrown off between norepinephrine and, uh, and probably serotonin and acetylcholine. And so it causes a fast running alpha, even though typically they would have a slower running alpha because of the fact that they had a concussion. And once NUCA is done, that does seem to settle down. I, I, only, I don't have too much evidence, but I, only, I have one case at this point in time that showed that after NUCA, that fast running eyes closed alpha did slow down, which suggests to me that, yeah, there was a neurotransmitter imbalance as a result of inflammation of the brainstem. And also there's anxiety associated with that condition. So the anxiety was resolved at the same time. So who should have their upper cervical bone positioning examined? Well. Pretty much anyone with muscle spasms in their neck and shoulders, anyone with back, hip, IT band spasms, idiopathic knee pain, leg and foot soreness, pain, lower back pain as well. I would say all athletes, like literally all athletes who are in uh, rough type sports, such as hockey, football, soccer, or European football, anyone who rides a horse, gymnast, Cyclists who ride the bikes with the bars that go down and they have to hold their head up in a kinked position for long periods of time should have their atlas bone looked at. Anyone in an accident ranging from simply falling on the ground because they tripped over a curb or a sidewalk piece or, or they slipped on the ice, motor vehicle accidents and so on. As for me, I threw my atlas bone out simply by doing some somersaults once at a conference and I had severe spasms all through my chest and back, so much so that I was having difficulty breathing. So now we're gonna talk about ET. And hi ET, pleased to meet you. So ET, uh, these are just some intake information. And this is really nothing that is important, but it's just part of our intake. And you can read that and you can see, yeah, you know, just some typical childhood things sometimes that occurs. But now as an adult, he enjoys outdoor activities such as cycling, jet skis, snowboarding, and he's quite active physically. He enjoys engine mechanics, loves outdoors, and he rides dirt bikes as well. And that's what led him to me. So in April 2019, he was riding his dirt bike on a track when another rider cut in front of him and hit his front tire. This threw E.T. off his bike where he landed on his head. He had a helmet on and he had a neck brace as well and other protective gear. But, and he didn't lose consciousness either, but he was dazed. He stopped riding, drove home, but was not his normal chatty self that evening. The next morning and the following three mornings, he would have these episodes, which uh, is what his father calls it. Uh, this is written by his father. And these episodes within an hour of awakening and they would last from five to 30 minutes and he would not be able to speak. He could understand what was being said to him. And he knew what he wanted to say, but he could not move his mouth. His mouth is paralyzed. And he had no pain as well. So after two emergency room visits with all types of uh, professionals, they couldn't find any injury. And his father asked that the ER doctors to admit him so they could capture an episode immediately after he woke up on an EEG. And they did capture his third episode on the EEG. 
but they came back telling him that it looked normal. And I'll show you EEGs uh, a little later on here, and you'll see the problem with using an EEG for what we think is a brainstem seizure. But anyway, they said they were not seizures, and they certainly are not the standard cortical type seizures that you would expect to see that involve neurons of the cortex. Anyway, over the next nine months, he didn't have any more episodes, but he struggled with sensitivity to lights and sound, short-term memory issues, and his balance was off center for about three months. All of these issues forced him to drop out of college. On January 4th, 2020, he suddenly had another episode, but this time it affected his arms and legs. On January 25th, he also had an episode and then another, another episode every day through to February 6th. All episodes affected his arms, legs, and mouth and lasted 10 to 45 minutes. And they had to catch him too, or because he would fall over if he had it while he was standing. He, he would fall to the ground. During these multi-day episodes, his father recorded everything he ate, drank, watched, how he slept. He also started 200 milligrams of CBD per day, vitamin D and magnesium. The common link with these episodes was that they seemed to happen immediately or two to three hours after he showered. And they stopped him from showering on February 9th. He showered a few days later without putting his head under the water and it did not trigger an episode. On February 10th, he showered again, put his head under the water and immediately this triggered an episode that lasted an hour, which was the longest episode he has had as of that time. As of today, February 13th, no more episodes or showers. And he continues to take his CBD, vitamin D, and magnesium. Now, what happened here is that not long before this, I was lecturing in the Sacramento area. And his father had attended one of my lectures on the brain machines that we make, uh, notably the audiovisual entrainment and the research we had done with concussions. And that's what led his father to give me a call and for them to fly up, just getting into the pre-COVID era. And he flew up to Canada and then we, uh, we ran the EGs and so on. So here we go, let's take a look. Here he is, here he is having an episode right here. Now, as you know, one of the things we talked about with the subluxated atlas bone is typically there's spasms on one side of the body and look how crooked his head is on his shoulder and his neck. I had to give him some massaging just to loosen up that shoulder. And then here I am, you can see I'm putting his cap on and you can see his eyes are open. You can too see with the episode, his eyes are open uh, and he can hear and he can see, but he cannot move and he cannot speak. And it looks very much like an absence seizure, except it's not an absence seizure. Now with some massaging and such, I was able to uh, loosen up that shoulder and neck and get the cap on him because I didn't want a bunch of muscle, you know, EMG getting into my recordings as well, but he was also uncomfortable. I didn't want really getting a pain signature in my recording either, or him constantly squirming around in the chair when I was trying to take a recording. Now he is not drinking a coffee here, he's just drinking some water. So what is the difference between a brainstem seizure and an absence seizure? This is an EEG recording of an absence seizure and definitely that is observable on an EEG, you can't miss it. Giant waves, you can see that in this case, they aren't that long, you know, they're like 10 seconds long or less in this case, maybe eight seconds long. So what are the similarities between what appear to be a brainstem seizure and an absence seizure. Well, the similarities are is that the person is very still. They come on suddenly and they're not talking or moving. And then they also suddenly return to activity when the seizure ends. An absence seizure is typically 30 seconds long. This brainstem seizures are typically five to 30 minutes. And then he had one that lasted as long as an hour. The absence seizure has large spike in wave activity. A brainstem seizure looks very normal on an EEG, and that's why at the hospital they didn't observe it. However, if you have a database that displays phase measures, you will see phase issues uh, clearly showing up. So here is a recording here of him with his eyes closed, just in the chair with his eyes closed. And his, his activity is quite normal. We see that he's got alpha spindle stacking, which is quite nice overall. Uh, it's mostly located in the uh, parietal occipital areas where it belongs. And it's quite in phase as well, uh, which is also uh, how it should look. When we process him on the uh, QEEG, 
We see that in this case that his eyes close is a little bit slow. He's pushing about nine and a half hertz uh, for his uh, eyes closed alpha. And although I say that's a little bit slow, it actually is still uh, uh, considered a very normal EEG. And it could be uh, certainly eyes closed alpha can range anywhere from uh, you know nine ish to about 11 and be considered uh, in many cases to be quite normal EEG. We do see though uh, on the, you see on the magnitude side, which is at five microvolts. And then we look at the right hand side, which is the database. And typical of concussions, we often will see the, the sort of frequency bands from SMR up into the beta bands is, um, it, it's low in this case, it's definitely suppressed a bit. And that's quite common with concussions. We also see that as we get up in the, the bottom row on the right hand side, 29 Hertz to about 35, we see that activity starting to show that is actually muscle tension. It's not uh, brainwave activity at all, just artifact. Looking at what stood out and coherence, which is a measure of variability of phase, uh, we certainly see that there is some uh, lack of coherence with his eyes closed in the delta band and somewhat frontally in the SMR band. Nothing overly big. And sometimes coherence in the delta band, you gotta be a little bit careful because of artifacts and things They can cause coherence measures that are artifactual. Here we're looking at uh, phase in the delta band and phase in the theta band. And we do see he's got some temporal lobe issues which are persistent throughout all the recordings we took. Now here's his eyes open, not with the seizure, just eyes open. And again, fairly normal. We see that he's got, has alpha suppression now in this case, which is very typical of eyes open. He makes the occasional little spindle here and there. And overall, it's a pretty clean record. I like taking clean recordings and I will go to great lengths to get a clean recording. And we happen to have a good clean recording here, which is good. There's a couple of eye blinks there. Anyway, it looks very, very typical, very, very normal. Take a look at it this from another perspective. We can see here, um, looking at independent component analysis, uh, just some of the dipoles that are showing up in his brain. And uh, uh, you can see the temporal lobe issue showing up on that right side there at the back in the 3D image. And, and we do have some issues with that that are probably concussion related. So we can see here in his eyes open, uh, he's got some uh, centered you know, stuff centered around the cingulate at two hertz, and it lingers a little bit at, in the theta band. Uh, we still see, again, the blue stuff from the SMR band and up, uh, 12 hertz and up, and that, which is often very typical. Uh, you can see this on the database side. And that's quite typical of people who have had uh, brain injuries from concussions and so on, uh, depressed activity in those bands. Overall, we see a few little phase issues. We see a frontal posterior phase issue uh, that shows up a bit in the delta band and the theta band a little bit, in the alpha band a little bit, not in the SMR band, and a little bit of phase issue going around in the, in the beta bands as well. But this is nothing very strong and it wouldn't really be clinical at all. So uh, that's what that is. Now here is his trance. Now with the trance, you'll see different things. Look at this here. We see some rolling delta going on in his trance. We see um, quite a misalignment of the alpha spindles. And you'll see that the, the generators are also at different frequencies from time, from time to time. His eyes sometimes roll around a great deal, even though they're open. They will roll around during the trance. And we see a fair disconnection on the co-modulation side between his alpha spindles and so on. So that's what he looks like during an actual trance with his eyes open. So let's take process that and see what that looks like. And here we can see on the left side, which is just eyes open and versus the right side with the trance. And we can see now that there are clearly differences that are showing up in the independent component analysis or the ICA. Uh, between the two conditions. Again, clinically, could you tell them apart if you were just running this analysis? It, it might be difficult to uh, note, to really tell by this me these measures. But when you compare the two, we can see it. We also see here that the difference between, um, in this case here, we're now we're looking at um, uh, the magnitude at three microvolts and we're looking at the database at 
two standard deviations. It looks relatively similar to just his eyes open condition. But the phase is very significant now. And we see the delta phase and the theta phase, uh, but mostly the delta phase, we see some pretty big issues going on here. We also see severe phase issues in the alpha band and the SMR bands. And we see phase issues in the beta two bands and the beta three bands that are very significant now in this case. Uh, so we do see that indeed, yes, this is being affected now on a cortical level from what is going on in his brainstem. But typically a lot of EEGs, they don't look at phase. And if, and if the database doesn't have a phase measure, it's not very useful, in my opinion, for looking at concussions at all. And certainly not for looking at people with subluxated atlas bones. So what did I do? I sent ET to my NUCA people. What's NUCA, you ask? Well, NUCA stands for National Upper Cervical Chiropractic Association. NUCA is, is a branch of chiropractic that gets uh, very involved in objective measures where, where they look at body misalignments and they also do very carefully orchestrated x-rays. And the people at Symmetry Spinal Care in Edmonton are amongst the best NUCA practicing clinicians that I have had the pleasure of meeting and they've treated me a couple of times over the years, which I was very grateful for. And results that are cervically based are treated very quickly. Typically the very first treatment you have, you will feel better. And typically issues are completely resolved within a half a dozen treatments. So yeah, NUCA, when, it, when it's applied properly to people who have a subluxated atlas bone uh, is fast and effective and very affordable. So when the atlas and nearby bones are misaligned, the resulting pressure to the brainstem can inflame the brainstem and result in imbalanced neurotransmitters, muscle spasms anywhere in the body, pain, anxiety, mental fog, migraine, and more. Just to recap what we've been talking about earlier. And the NUCA procedures work to reduce these interferences to the nervous system caused by the misalignment of the craniocervical junction and they're using as a precise non-invasive spinal adjusting technique. In fact, typically what they will do is they'll just use a knuckle or a fingertip and they'll push firmly, but still fairly gently on the atlas bone and they will push it back into place. And then they will uh, re-X-ray just to confirm whether or not they got the atlas bone bang on or not. And if they're a little bit off, they will give it another little push and then just recheck until they've got it uh, perfectly done. So my experience with NUCA, around 2010, I did a bunch of consecutive somersaults at an ISNR conference, just having fun. And I planted myself a bit wrong on one of the somersaults and I bonked my head on the carpet. And I felt it clang, but it, it didn't hurt me at all. Anyway, I did a few more somersaults uh, before I stopped. I didn't think there was gonna be any issues. Three days later, I had severe spasms through my back and chest, and they were so severe that I was having difficulty breathing. That's, that's how bad the spasms were. I had several visits with standard chiropractors and actually got worse. And same thing with physiotherapy. So anyway, fortunately, a colleague of mine uh, put me onto the NUCA because he had been working with some concussion uh, clients of his own and had discovered the NUCA process as a result of that. Anyway, I went and had the NUCA and they had me fixed up very, very quickly, just in a few days. I threw my back neck out again in, in 2020 and required another adjustment. I also had found that I could tell how they were pushing on my neck. And if I threw my neck out uh, accidentally uh, over, the, over the years, I could put my own vertebrae back into place. And I can certainly recall one incident where I was sailing and I was cranking the winch. And if you're spinning a winch fast to bring a sail into place, your head is bouncing back and forth from your arm movements going around and around and around in a sideways motion on the winch, uh, you know, spinning this big handle or the lever on this winch. And, and, I, and immediately I was pulling in a sail and, and I just knew I threw my, my neck out and suddenly I went into spasms and my gut, suddenly my head went into this weird fog. I felt all spinny and I had a spasm in my right shoulder just suddenly. And so I just handed the winch over to one of my shipmates. 
I went and laid on the bed and I got my, my knuckle out and I just pushed gradually on my neck for about a minute. And then I felt the tension just drop off. Went back up and continued a day of sailing. So it is pretty amazing how this works. And it's also quite amazing how easily you can throw off an atlas bone. So here I am showing one of the measures that they do. And you can see here, uh, this was in 2020 when I had thrown my neck off uh, doing some things. And you can see just how crooked my back is. And so these are one of the measures that they do just to see if you qualify to get the x-ray next. And of course, with my back like this, I did qualify to get x-rays. If they were very straight, they probably wouldn't have x-rayed me. They also do your hip measurements as well. So here I am now in the x-ray device, forward and backwards, and they do a couple of sideways ones as well. And, uh, and then when they're done, they put your, your head uh, on this very hard little pill that pushes uncomfortably on your, on your ears. And, and then they will do the manipulation of the uh, atlas bone and get it back into place. So there you go. That's how the NUCA process basically works. Now, in the case of ET, well, we can see here that he had alignments both rotationally. He had them uh, from, from a coronal view. He had them sideways from a sagittal view. He had um, all three axes, basically. He had uh, misalignments in all three axes. And here are the x-rays. And you can see his neck, how crooked that is, especially in the center picture. You can see the crookedness. You can also see how he's rotated on the right-hand picture some. The left-hand picture, I can't really quite tell that the atlas bone is up because I'm not trained in, in uh, chiropractic or we're really looking at x-rays too much. So I could, really couldn't see it on the left side, but the chiropractor certainly can. <clears throat> then they do all their measurements and you can see they've got little lines and things going all over the place. So this is what they said to me. Uh, from the Nuka people, they said, we want to know where the kinks or the angles are between the atlas and the skull center. So that misalignment, and they're also looking at the atlas and neck center misalignments, and how far the skull and neck are off center with respect to gravity. So they're also looking at skull lean and neck lean. ET's alignment results were good, but not excellent. This is after they, they adjusted them. He is more complicated because the skull center does not meet the base of his skull at 90 degrees. There is some asymmetry of his occipital condyles, which are the two gray lines with the green angle. This asymmetry is taken into account when we look at comparing the pre and post treatment atlas misalignments. So both atlas to skull and atlas to neck angles. And so this is what they do. It's beyond me. But we can certainly see that things are at angles when you look at some of their measurements there. So had him in, except of course, as you know, he was in, in my office. We did the EEGs on him. He had, a, he had an episode during an EEG where we saw these severe phase issues. I had him stand against the wall. I could tell he was knotted up on one side of the shoulder. Of course, I already knew this uh, when he first came in because his neck is so crooked. Fortunately, they had an opening that afternoon and we sent him off to the Symmetry Spinal Care people. They did a NUCA assessment and adjustment on him, and he was already better next day. Surprisingly, when I ran the EEG next day, he looked very similar to what he was, just eyes open and eyes closed. There, there was no real change. Of course, eyes open and eyes closed EEGs, for the most part, weren't overly problematic anyway. And so there was actually no changes, which I guess would make sense. And he never had an episode the second day when I brain mapped him. So there was nothing to see there because now he did, yeah, his brain was running better and he didn't have an episode. So, so anyway, April 18th. So I saw him in, in late February, April 18th report from his father. ET had his third week appointment today since his last adjustment. And he is holding his last episodes were several days ago and lasted less than one minute each. So still making good progress. Muscle spasm still happening with episodes, but much less intense. I should mention though, a little something here. It takes a little bit of time uh, to get the cartilage and such and all the tendons and muscles to readjust and reseat and hold the head stable. And what happened is uh, they went back uh, to their homes in California and ET had gone a week without any episodes. 
Then E.T. stuck his head under the tap to get a drink of water. He popped his atlas bone out of place and had three seizures in a row. And uh, the father, of course, was very upset and panicky about it and distressed and gave me a call right away. We found a Nuka practitioner in Sacramento, which wasn't too far from their home. We fired off the x-rays and such to that uh, chiropractor and they did a, a realignment the next day and got him back into place. So this is since that incident. April 25th, ET hasn't had an episode in over a week. The last few were very short or mild and his C1 alignment has been holding for the past four weeks. Those last few episodes may have just been part of the healing process, but we have our fingers crossed with each uneventful day. April 30th, ET had a couple small episodes, so we knew something had changed. He went a total of four weeks without a C1 adjustment. That was also good news, but when it shifts, it triggers episodes as expected. He is aligned again, because uh, I went to see the Nuka practitioner, and no episodes, so excellent correlation. Uh, his father, I should mention, is an engineer, and he's very evidence-based in everything he observes, which is a good thing. Hopefully, we can get two, three, or six months of alignment this time, fingers crossed. Okay, the better news is that he feels good. He's starting to exercise again and looking to enroll back into college. He is also starting to drive, but only if someone is in the vehicle. And believe it or not, to date, the medical bills totaled $102,000, uh, 12,000 of which they paid through copay. The cost of NUCA is 1,000 to 2,000 dollars, depending on how many adjustments uh, he needs. So it's very affordable as well as effective. Here, May 23rd, 2020, in general, he is doing well. He started physical therapy this week with the chiropractor's approval, and they're strengthening his neck for more stability. His last C1 slip was about 12 days ago. However, he did have one episode four days ago after lifting some boxes over his head, and he wasn't supposed to do that. It also lasted seven minutes. Unfortunately, he did not fall over when it occurred. June 17th, 2020, six weeks now without a slip. He is back to school and doing well. Started physical therapy about two weeks ago to help strengthen his neck. Fingers crossed, we don't see any future slips. September 26th, so now he's been a while, over six months now. I wanted to update you on ET's progress. It's been great. No episodes in months. And now he's back in college, back working again, and of course, driving and enjoying life. Such a huge change from February when we walked into your office. Here it is now a year later, February 21. A year ago today, E.T. and I were in your office. Today, E.T. is with his girlfriend, hiking in the Grand Canyon. Amazing difference. We can't thank you enough. So as clinicians, be open to these types of things, especially with concussion. And also be aware too that you may need to get some physio and other things involved as well. And although the results are very immediate, it's kind of easy to throw that atlas bone off for a while until the, the whole neck and spinal area get stabilized and back into place. Again, look at him now at the onset when we first saw him. And here he is a year later. What a difference. And look how his shoulder has changed and how his neck positioning is very straight now. Very, very different. So there you go. I'm taking a selfie of myself. You can easily do a quick NUCA assessment on your own clients. Just get some, uh, in this case, I'm using painter's tape because it's, it's not too sticky on the back, but you could use whatever tape you want. Put it on your wall. Use a level when you put it on so that it's exactly horizontal. In this case, I just have three lines showing a few different you know, shoulder placements and, and a hip placement, but really I would recommend you have maybe six or seven or eight lines because you're gonna have clients of various heights. And so you need to be able to eyeball them better. And in this case too, I have a, you know, just a loose shirt on. You would want them to have a, a much better shirt than that because you really can't see my hip placements in this case. So you can do this in your own office uh, very easily and then decide how you want to proceed from there. Okay, take a picture while you're at it. Also make sure they're in their sock feet. So conclusion, it pays to consider 
every patient is research and then take the time to pursue the possibilities. In other words, don't rush. And that is the problem with every profession. Medical has its point of view. Our profession in neuroscience has its point of view. We must be open to the fact that we don't know everything and we need to be inclusive of other professions, especially if we definitely see dramatic cause and effects as we have with uh, ET in this case, and which I see with all of my clients who have had some kind of concussion or have had their head rattled around in a whiplash and we've also worked with sports professionals and have had their atlas bones realigned, uh, which makes a fair bit of difference on general body aches and pains, uh, and which also improves their performance in their sport. So it's a good thing to do all the time anyway. Anyway, given the complexities of the brain, keep your eyes and ears open to techniques and therapies outside of your own profession to see any factors which may tie into a medical condition. This includes nutrition, posture, chiropractic, as in the case of NUCA, exercise, environment, lifestyle management, hormones, et cetera, et cetera. Be open to all of it. These are complicated areas that we're working on. Given that subluxated cervical and atlas bones can have dramatic effects on the brain, they must be considered in every concussion, whiplash, or bounced around case. And, now we need to reflect on something here because there are some databases out there that have metrics supposedly for the diagnosis of concussion. But if they have not factored in that a lot of their EEGs may well be including people with subluxated atlas bones, which we know here in this case at least really throws phase off, uh, there may be cases where their standard deviations now are very wide and they will look at people with in this case, doing the metrics on their um, uh, concussion, and they may actually come out as non-concussed because if their atlas bone wasn't thrown off and their phase is in better condition than it would be with an atlas bone that is thrown off, they will look better than potentially they actually are. So these databases have flaws in that regard. And if a person is making up a concussed type of database, every one of those People in that database should have the NUCA treatment done first before their EEGs are added to the database, just to make sure everything is clean. So thank you very much for listening to this fascinating lecture and these discoveries on just how important the spinal bones are in brain function. And so thank you again very much for watching my lecture. Stay well, stay healthy, and we'll see you later. Bye-bye.